Hi, I'm Charlie Jimerson from the law firm of Jimerson and Cobb, and I'm here to speak to you today on the payment process on a construction project. Uh, before we get into the presentation, just a little bit about myself. Uh, you're welcome to visit our firm's website, jimersoncobb.com. Uh, my biography is on that site. Um, I am a board-certified construction lawyer. Uh, all the partners at my firm are board-certified construction lawyers, uh, and we are board. Or we are construction law firm located in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, handle matters throughout the state of Florida and really handle projects throughout uh, the country. Uh, just so that you understand a little bit about my background, uh, we represent all levels of construction industry folks, uh, whether it be very large general contractors, design build type contractors, uh, subcontractors and tradesmen, uh, sureties, uh, insurance companies pertaining to construction coverage claims and uh, have a great deal of experience in material supply. Um, so what we're here to talk to you today about is the, the payment process in hopes that uh, whether you're a lawyer seeing this uh, as a continuing education or you're a construction industry professional hoping to bone up a little bit more on uh, the laws pertaining to the payment process, uh, you'll have a greater understanding of how money flows, where it comes from, and some barriers to collecting that money. So uh, I've got some gadgets built into our slides and I'll do my best to follow along with those. So you'll have to pardon me if I am using my mouse here to move forward with my presentation. Uh, but just by way of introduction, conceptually construction projects are no different than any other projects, uh, in any other business. Uh, notion being cash is king. Cash really puts people out of business in construction and for reasons why, why we'll uh, go through a little bit later, but uh, cash is controlled by the lenders and owners uh, and a lot of times they get to make the rules and they're contracting. Um, there has to be cash flow in the building trade. That's the very lifeblood of the enterprise. Um, it has enormous impact. The payment process has enormous impact on the cash flow of any given construction project. So as a roadmap of where we're, we're going and what we'll discuss today, uh, we'll start with talking about the flow of money, giving you an overview of how money flows on a construction project. Then an idea of the payment process, uh, the document flow that's associated with construction payments, uh, the documents themselves that are associated with uh, construction payments, the timing of everything, uh, and then an idea of subcontractor cash flow. Then we'll move on to condition, conditions precedent to payment. Uh, specifically with the contractor, we'll discuss payment applications. We'll discuss architect, or architect certification for payment. And then we'll discuss contractors' final payment affidavits. Uh, with respect to subcontractors or contractors, we'll discuss releases. And with respect to subcontractors, we'll discuss some uh, potential pitfall areas or items to be considered of, such as contingent payments, pay when paid clauses, uh, payment timing, and other requirements such as closeout requirements. And lastly, we'll discuss retainage and its impact on the construction payment process. So moving into our first substantive slide regarding the flow of money. As you can see, the money starts with the lender, and then it trickles down to the owner, to the general contractor, and it ends with a subcontractor. But the payment process doesn't start and stop that way. Uh, well before the money flows, the payment process begins. And that begins with the subcontractor and goes up through the GC, up through the owner, and ultimately concludes the lender. So to discuss document flow, um, the uh, construction loans for lenders are very similar to a line of credit that can be drawn against as desired. Uh, as construction funds are drawn, the balance and in interest due rises. Uh, draws are typically submitted monthly, but can be arranged on a bi-monthly basis or as needed. And most loans have a specific set number of draws uh, included and paid for. If additional draws are required, the lender or fund control agent may require additional fees. The primary difference with a construction loan is that the funds must be requested in the various forms of draw requests, which we'll go over, which may, must be supported by in invoicing or documentation 
canceled checks, other type of proofs of payments. Now, with our slide that we're looking at here, the payment process starts at the bottom with the subs and suppliers by submitting documents to the GC. As you see, it goes up one level. level the GC submits documents to the owner based on what is received from the subs and suppliers. The owner, with the help from the architect, approves the general contractor's documents and submits them along with other documents to the lender. Lender receives the documents, has them independently reviewed for approval, and may take other steps as required by the contract documents. Sometimes that might be a title search, etc. So, <clears throat> contractors submit applications for payment to the general contractor on a monthly basis, typically on the 20th of the month. Uh, the GC provides the form. Uh, the references that I have on our slide here is this AIA G702. Uh, that's a typical form that's used in the industry and large projects by reputable contractors. Uh, the general contractors generally submit one application for payment to the owner on a monthly basis. Uh, typically, this is on the 25th of the month and also using a Form 702 if they're using AIA, AIA docs on the project. I've got some forms uh, in our slide there um, which exemplify that and we'll go over the 702 uh, momentarily. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things that the GCs will submit as they're submitting payment, uh, the pay apps up to the owner are whatever the respective lien release associated with the um, the application. Typically it's a conditional lien release or a partial uh, lien waiver. Um, the owner, along with the project architect, will then review the contractor's uh, payment application for payment uh, to ensure that it requires the, uh, requests the proper amount of money in comparison to the actual work completed on the project. The owner then submits the GC's documents to the lender along with a separate draw request that the owner compiles, which includes the owner's soft costs. An example of that might be one of which I've included in the materials. Once the documents make their way to the lender, the lender then independently re reviews them for accuracy and uh, items which may mitigate the lender's risk. Once the documents are approved, the lender releases the funds to the owner on the draw and the money begins to trickle its way down to the parties, much like that schematic that we showed you on the first slide. I'm on slide 10 and we're now moving on to the timing process. And since this has some gadgets on the slide, I'm going to go one by one just to give you an idea of the way that timing works on a construction project. So let's say that just using round numbers and on, on the timeline, January 1st, the subcontractor commences work and begins paying its employees and suppliers. January 20th, subcontractor would, would submit its monthly payment application. 25th, GC submits its payment application upstream to the owner. February 10th, the owner pays the GC. Uh, that's a, provided that there's no issues that are preventing payment or there's a quick turnaround on the payment application. February 24th, the GC pays the sub. As you can see in this timeline, in a perfect world, and this is under an ideal scenario, the subcontractor gets paid 55 days after performing the work. In other words, he's floating, he or she is floating 55 days worth of payroll to the uh, of ma and material purchases. Um, this is obviously a challenge and then moving on to slide 11 uh, for subcontra some contractor cash flow. Here's a straight line example on this slide based on a typical HVAC sub with a $400,000 subcontract amount and a four month duration on a $10,000 project. The sub incurs about as you'll see in it, it sub occurs about 25000 in cost outlays each week while it's working. Um, and let's track the net effect which the payment cycle uh, encumbers the sub and burdens the sub. Subcontractor commences work on January 1st. By the time that the pay application is submitted for uh, the sub for $100,000 worth of work, 
it's already submit it's already outlaid a hundred thousand dollars worth of work just before it even gets around to putting an application in by the 25th by the, I'm sorry by the 25th by the time the GC submits its work it's a, it's a little bit over a hundred thousand month goes by the owner pays the GC subs into the project now if it's twenty five thousand dollars a week for one hundred seventy five thousand before the first dollar is received and by the end of its third month on the job it's a cool hundred fifty thousand dollars behind uh, on the project in advance uh, the work has been performed but yet unpaid as you can imagine for small subcontractors <coughs> this is crippling and it's quite a gamble for the sub if they're defects or if they're required set-offs. I don't think a lot of tradesmen uh, fully understand that uh, when they're getting into the construction business and that's why there can be a lot of by-night contractors, uh, subcontractors on projects because they don't understand the capital or they, they're not, they don't understand it or they're not well capitalized uh, to float a construction project. Moving on to slide 12, which is the contractor pay app. An application for payment is a construction document that identifies and presents a method on how the contractor will be paid. It contains the services or items that's being incorporated or jobs being executed under the respective contract agreement. It's presented as a list with the unit price of each item and the quantities of material or product being furnished. <coughs> It provides both the owner and the contractor with a method of controlling what items or materials have been provided by the contractor. And it's a great tool to expedite the payment process and minimize the error possibility. Some typical payout forms uh, widely used are the AIA G702, which we've alluded to, and to the consensus docs world. Uh, the consensus docs 291 is an application for payment on a guaranteed maximum price contract. 292 is a pay app for a lump sum contact contract and a 293 incorporates the schedule of values format. Um, an example of the 702 is on slide 13 and this is the American Institute of Architects form 702 which contractors often used to apply for payment from the architect. Uh, these applications include specific information regarding the total amount of the work, dollar amount of the work completed, uh, retainage, total payments due to date, a summary of the change orders, and the current payment that's requested. For more information on the form, you you're feel free to visit the AIA's uh, website. On a particular example, note the highlighted por portion of the form where the contractor is certifying several things such as completion of the work and financial accuracy of the application. The contractor's uh, application for payment is tantamount to an affidavit. It's their swearing of everything that's contained in the document, the progress, the amounts owed, the lien releases, etc. It may be used against the contractor or later tries to include a different or higher amount uh, that it's due, such as in a claim of lien. Uh, courts are entitled to rely on the accuracy of these statements in the sworn applications. <clears throat> now, moving on to slide 15, and this is the on architect's certification for payment. Now, under a con typical construction contract, an architect has to certify the payment. Uh, 702 application for payment and 703 continuation sheet provide for convenient and complete forms on which the contractor can can apply for and the architect can certify that payment is due. Uh, we've talked about what the forms the 702 requires the contractor to do, um, but let's talk about exactly what the 702 requires the the architect to do and how the architect might view the certification process. Um, architect's going to look at the contract sum to date, uh, the dollar amount for work completed and stored to date, uh, the amount of retainage, uh, the total previous payments, summary of change orders, etc. Uh, through the 702, it's going to break the contract sum into portions of the work in accordance with the schedule of values prepared by the contractor as required by the general conditions of the contract agreement. Um, 
note that if it's a schedule of values format, the AIA does not furnish a particular schedule of values form. Um, 702, again, can serve as both the pay app and the architect certification, uh, and it uh, has to be completed and acceptable to the architect. Uh, the architect's signature certifies to the owner that the payment and the amount indicated is due to the contractor. Uh, it also allows, and it's worth noting, that the form allows the architect to certify an amount different than the amount applied for with an explanation provided by the architect. And on our slide 16, there's an idea of where the certification is directly below the contractor certification. Contractor's final payment affidavits. In a nutshell, the contractor's final payment affidavit must state that all leaners have been paid in full or show the name of each leaner who has not been paid in full and the amount due or to become to the, due to that leanor. The owner then must ask for, and the contractor is obligated to provide a contractor payment, final payment affidavit before any payment is made. That's typically per the terms of the contract as well as statutory mechanics liens mechanisms. Um, the contractor, uh, well, making a final payment to a contractor without receiving a final payment affidavit causes the payment to be an improper payment which has varying degrees of impact upon state laws uh, or the contract, but most notably it could subject the owner uh, to paying multiple times for a particular periodic payment under a construction contract uh, and could affect the lien rights of the lien or. Um, if the affidavit lists unpaid lien ors uh, or the owner has received a notice to owner from anyone without receiving a release from them, it should make the final payment to the contractor without first consulting an attorney, obviously. <coughs> the, I've cited some items in, uh, on the slides there, that some case law pertaining to the owner's right to retain final payment until such time as the contractor furnishes the affidavit as well as uh, a Florida statute pertaining to the owner's entitlement uh, or the contractor's requir requirement to give the contractor's final payment affidavit. I'm going to next move into releases. Now, in the mechanics lien process, a lien waiver from a contractor, subcontractor, material man, equipment, lessor, or other party uh, to the construction project, a lien waiver is their statement that they've received payment and waive any future lien rights to the property uh, of the owner whose project they're working on. Generally, there are four types of lien waivers. There's the conditional waiver on a progress payment, unconditional waiver on a progress payment, conditional on final, unconditional on final. Uh, conditional waivers on progress payments are the safest waiver for claimants. Uh, this waiver generally specifies that if they have indeed, they have indeed been paid to date, um, and that includes no returned or stopped payment checks, and that the waiver is an effective proof against any lien claim on the property. Unconditional waiver uh, releases all rights through a specific date unconditionally, uh, and that includes no return or stop payment checks. Now, uh, one thing that's important to note in the waiver and release process is if you're a contractor and you're certifying that work is done through a certain date, make sure that correlates with your pay applications and make sure that the date certain is accurate uh, in your own internal records uh, because if you're releasing through a certain date, there's a good chance that, well, you're going to release that and you're not going to have rights through that certain date. Anything accrued thereafter, you may have lien rights to, but the date certain is going to be the critical component and not necessarily the amount on the lien release. It's important to note that lien releases are many contracts, so whatever is in the contract, uh, what, whatever it is in the contract and accepted by the owner on your releases, uh, typically are going to have some legal effect, uh, especially if it changes uh, the posture of the parties as to their contracts. Now on the conditional waiver, um, 
conditionals and unconditionals. I think uh, the unconditional is the safest waiver for the owner. Obviously, you want to get the lien claimants to release all of their rights and responsibilities uh, or, or rights uh, to, to the mechanics lien or the construction lien uh, unconditionally, uh, in, immaterial to the payment of check. Uh, so that's, I think that there's a, this always ongoing dichotomy on a project as to what liens are going to be provided on progress, what liens are going to be conditional, what liens are going to be unconditional. You can deal with that up front in the terms of the contract and how the contract's going to be administered. Architect can serve as that intermediary, uh, but you want to have some understanding as the money starts to flow how the lien releases are going to flow. When in doubt, you can use an escrow agent, third party, uh, to hold the funds and the liens uh, to help facilitate that if there's a dispute. Um, lien releases only need to be in the form of statutory release. Uh, courts will uphold uh, such provisions as a condition precedent to payment so long as the uh, provision is not vague and ambiguous, uh, um, specifically uh, many contracts that require release of liability, um, but the lien component is only uh, going to be governed by the stat respective statute. Um, again, your contract is going to be really dispositive as to what and how lien releases should be exchanged and what the required terms and language are. Um, Moving on to, uh, well, there's some examples of lien releases here in our presentation on page 21, uh, both a conditional upon a progress and conditional upon final. Now, continuing on with conditions precedent to payment, uh, there's for subcontractors, well, for, for all contractors and subcontractors, but particularly for subcontractors, they need to be aware of pay when paid or pay if paid def uh, type of provisions. It's a clause that's frequently included in subcontracts, and they state uh, it's a clause that states if the general contractor is not required to pay the sub, unless and until the project owner pays the GC. Um, such provisions obviously can be problematic to subcontractors when collection action is necessary. Uh, if the sub demands payment and the GC has been paid by the owner, certainly they will be able to revert back to a pay when paid clause uh, on the basis that it's not been paid by the owner. Um, they are enforceable in Florida. Um, courts are split nationwide on enforceability of pay when paid clauses. The following states have ruled that these clauses or certain variations of them are valid and they shift the risk from the owner non-payment to the sub. Uh, that's Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, Illinois, Michigan, and Maryland. Um, in contrast, California and New York have totally abolished the pay when paid clauses. In other states, the enforceability of these provisions remain unclear, but courts have tended to invalidate them. Uh, following states do not appear to have a steadfast rule on the, the, the uh, issue but tend to disfavor them, uh, and those are Alabama, Connecticut, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Washington, D.C. The Federal First and Fourth Circuit District Courts of Appeal have also invalidated these types of provisions for various region, reasons. Contingent payment clauses such as pay when paids uh, must be clearly and unambiguous, they must be clear and unambiguous in their terms, and they must clearly and unambiguously place the risk of non-payment on the subcontractor. The burden of clear expression in the language of the pay when paid is on the contractor, so thus it would be construed against the contractor in favor of the risk being on the contractor or owner. Um, <clears throat> I've cited some case law and some reference to that in our materials. Now I've given you some example here of a clause that was c enforced as a con contingent payment clause, and I'll read that for you. Final payment, inclusive of retention, shall be made within 30 days of completion of the project, acceptance of the same by the owner, 
and as a condition precedent, receipt of final payment of subcontractor from the owner. And that's from the Dyser Plumbing case in Florida, 2nd District. Uh, as you can see from that clause, uh, using our standards, employing our standards, it was clear, it was unambiguous, and it shifted the risk of non-payment to the to the subcontractor. Let's uh, view a clause that was not enforced as a contingent payment clause. Under no circumstances shall the contractor be obligated to pay the subcontractor until funds have been advanced by the owners. Another one for. Or well, for more examples of unambiguous clause, there's the Bentley construction case, which is also a Florida second DCA case. So you can see on the, comparing one clause to the other clause, enforceable versus unenforceable, the second one, which says until funds have been advanced by the owner, it doesn't necessarily say a condition precedent to performance. It doesn't clear and ambiguously shift the risk, and it, it certainly was construed against the contractor. Um, one thing to note with respect to contingent payment clauses and pay when paids is that they're not enforceable on a payment uh, payment bond for against the surety. Uh, in other words, a payment bond surety must pay the unpaid subcontractor even if the sub correction even if the contractor was not paid by the owner. Um, and that's a famous case in Florida, the OB, uh, Supreme Court case called the OBS versus Pace case. There is also an equitable defense on a contingent payment clause. Um, a contractor must col attempt to collect from the owner in good faith. If he doesn't, or he or she doesn't, the subcontractor can collect from the contractor notwithstanding an otherwise enforceable pay when paid or contingent payment clause. So. This can be a discovery just because that there's a, uh, a payment paid clause in a contract doesn't necessarily mean that it's a non. Uh, this is an issue that can't go to litigation. It means that there might be some discovery that needs to be taken on this particular issue, uh, namely whether the contractor's efforts to collect were in good faith and reasonable under the circumstances. And as, as I've cited here on page on 28 of our presentation, uh, Aline may provide a decent workaround for a sub that, does, that has a contingent payment clause. It's that component of security uh, that an otherwise uh, contra the contract wouldn't provide. Uh, so it's always important to note that on all sides, that uh, just because a contingent payment clause is there doesn't mean that a lien, uh, that the, the lien part, the party does not have lien rights. Uh, moving on to the time of payment. Uh, typically in a construction contract or a subcontract, it will include a time of payment clause that specifies the time and the manner of payment. However, if payment does, if it doesn't, payment must be made within 30 days. Uh, there are, under certain state statutes, certainly in Florida, 713-346, uh, there is a payment on construction uh, project prompt payment type of statute. Uh, which provides for a fallback, both for a fallback of when payment is due, as well as um, some remedies for failure to have prompt payment. Time of payment clause is best described as the requirement that the payee not be paid until the payment is received, rather than unless the payment is received. So, within, let's say, a contract has uh, a specific timing as to contractor has to pay subs within 15 days of receipt by the owner, that's the time of payment type of clause rather than the one we just reviewed, which is the contingent payment clause. Contractor doesn't have to pay subs until he's paid by the owner. Um, if a time of payment clause exists, the payee is entitled to receive payment after a reasonable time, even though the payor has not received payment, so long as the reason for payment to the payor is not the fault of the payee. That's a lot of ors and es, but uh, I think you'll be able to follow along that precedent by virtue of the citation in our slide. So there's also some uh, moving on, and we're concluding what is the conditions precedent uh, to payments portion of our uh, uh, of of payment in our payment process. Uh, another component is the project closeout. Um, 
The subcontractors may include other requirements uh, in closeout, and that's all going to be governed by your c contract. Typically, um, final payment will not be done until closeout documents are delivered, which in the circumstances may include warranty, submittals, as-built uh, drawings, etc. cetera. Um, here's an example I've put in our slide of contract-friendly subcontract uh, final payment clause, contractor-friendly subcontract final payment clauses. Moving on to the last part of our presentation regarding the construction payment process, and that's pertaining to retainage. Uh, retainage is a portion upon of the agreed upon contract price deliberately withheld until the work is substantially complete uh, to assure that the contractor or sub will satisfy its obligations and ultimately complete the construction project. In other words, retainage provides uh, incentive for the party performing the work to properly complete the work. 10% is typically industry standard with respect to retainage. Just uh, historically, uh, the practice of retainage dates back to uh, construction of the United Kingdom railway system in the 1840s. Uh, the size of the project increased demand for contractors, uh, which led to the entrance of new contractors in the labor market. Uh, these were fly-by-night, inexperienced, unqualified, uh, undercapitalized contractors uh, unable to su su successfully complete the project. Consequently, the railway companies began to withhold as much as 20% of the payments just to ensure that they would be able, these subs would be able to complete the project should, uh, should they, there be a default. Uh, point was to withhold the contractor's profit only, not only to make the contractor or its subs finance the project. Uh, given the often large scale complexity, cost and length of construction projects today, um, the risk of doing something, uh, performing a project not according to plan is almost certain. So retainage is really a necessity to offset those risks. Um, a, a common uh, approach is obviously including this retainage provision. And of course, retainage is something that needs to be included in the contract or else it's not going to be available. Um, conceptually, it's that incentive to complete the project, um, and also it's important to note that it protects the owner against liens, claims, pro uh, contract defaults, anything that surfaces throughout the course of a project which may uh, inhibit completion. Uh, more so now than ever, owners and contractors use this as a source of financing the project. Um, Contractors typically will seek to withhold a lot more retainage um, than a greater percentage that is being withheld from them. Uh, it's important as subs to uh, make sure that the retainage held is not going to cripple operations and cripple ultimate profit margin if it's ultimately needed to be offset. Uh, and for contractors, retainage needs to completely address risk. Same thing for owners. Um, if there's retainage on the pro project, again, it has to be set forth by the contract. <coughs> um, retainage provisions are applicable to subcontracts as well as prime contracts. Uh, the amount withheld, of course, determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the parties negotiating the contract, usually based on factors such as past performance, um, and the likelihood of the, or that the contractor or the sub will perform on, or default under the contract. Uh, solvency, creditworthiness are something that, that goes into play when evaluating retainage. One structure, uh, one can structure retainage in a number of ways, uh, subject to statutory requirements. 10% uh, again is the, the norm. Um, another approach is to start off with a 10% retainage and then reduce it to 5% once more than 50% of the project is complete. Um, a third approach is to carve out material costs from a withholding requirement on the theory that suppliers, unlike subs, may not accept retainage uh, provisions in their purchase orders. Um, change clauses are usually found within the contract terms outlining the procedure. 
the procedure will also need to be something that's within the contract. Uh, it typically parallels the following language. Owner shall pay the amount due on the payment application less retainage of blank. Insert whatever the specific percentages are. Um, and it's generally due, in terms of retainage payment, it's generally due once the work is substantially complete. Uh, determining when substantially substantial completion occurs is usually a very lit litigated issue. Uh, the standard analysis finds the event triggered uh, of substantial completion triggered when the owner can occupy this structure for its intended use and purpose, not necessarily uh, tracking issuance of a certificate of occupancy, but oftentimes it's tied into that. Um, retainage is rife for abuse. Uh, subcontractors tend to bear the brunt of retainage provisions, except especially those uh, performing work early on in the construction process. Uh, the main reason for this is that the, the contractors pass down the owner's right um, to withhold retainage, but frequently withhold more than was held, withheld from them and frequently don't uh, finalize until the whole project is done. Uh, as you can imagine, as we've already gone through the the cash flow process for a subcontractor, that's tough to do. I mean, that's most of their margin at that point. Um, for example, sub-completing site work uh, may complete its work in the first few months of the project, but it's generally not allowed to recover uh, retainage withheld until the substantial completion date, and that's going to be in accordance with the subcontract, which would typically incorporate the terms of the prime contract. Um, this could take a few years, depending on the size of the project. It just just depends. Um, coupled with, if you couple this with a contingent payment clause, re, you can imagine that retainage, uh, cash flow process, retainage, and a contingent pay clause could cause significant financial distress to a subcontractor who didn't do the legwork and write those things out of the contract on the front end. Um, Another problem, um, well, let's move an alternative. Uh, there are some alternatives that exist to standard retainers provisions that provide the same benefits and protections. Uh, for example, the parties could establish a trust account. Uh, a trust account could provide some control over the money, who has access to it, um, even if it was held by the owner or the owner's uh, counsel. Um, retainage could be withheld and placed in that trust account. Uh, which the trustee then would have a fiduciary relationship to the contractor uh, for management of that trust uh, money held in retainage. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, can The trustee then could also reinvest that money uh, at the contractor's direction, uh, allowing the contractor to essentially use the funds that would otherwise be dormant. Um, uh, other alternatives to retainage are allowing the contractor to substitute security to the owner in the form of a performance bond or otherwise, uh, perhaps, or, or other collateral, uh, perhaps a bank letter of credit um, or some type of United States-backed security, uh, such as bills, certificates, notes, or bonds. So that, in, in sum, should address the flow of money uh, on the payment process on a, collection, on a construction project, just in terms of what documents are submitted, who they go to, who has certain rights and responsibility. It's, I would probably be remiss if I didn't discuss a little bit about the collection process. Um, so the collection process, uh, if, if we have some type of payment default, um, a lot of times in construction projects there is going to be uh, the default remedies are going to be employed on the terms of the contract themselves, uh, specifically whether there's an independent decision maker, whether or not there's contractual conditions precedent to uh, enforcing the contract, be it a mediation, be it an arbitration, etc. Uh, but as a claimant who feels uh, and can meet the requirements to exert a statutory construction lien, uh, the collection, the payment process is often instituted through the lien process. Lien process uh, for subcontractor suppliers 
is going to require you to serve notices to the owner, uh, serve them in accordance with standards uh, articulated by state statute, uh, as well as perfect your record and serve your claim lien within the prescribed time periods. Um, often, if you're a contractor, contract state statutes require contractors' final payment affidavits to be proffered prior to uh, actually instituting an action. And, and it's important to also note that uh, in that collection process with asserting a lien, uh, most states have statute uh, limitations periods by which you're uh, bound to in order to foreclose your lien. So having knowledge of those process, both the noticing, the service, and the perfection requirements is just another component to getting paid on a construction project. Okay, uh, we are continuing to go through the payment process on a construction project and thankfully I've received fr some questions from the viewers, uh, great questions, uh, and I'd like to address them uh, to the extent that I'm able to. Um, so I'll just start with our first submission, and which is a good question. Uh, what are the biggest risks for the owner, general contractors, and subcontractors in the payment process? Uh, I think that the best way for me to break this down uh, is talking about item by item each party's particular risks. Um, so for an owner, uh, their risks are going to be ensuring that the project administration is properly uh, completed. Uh, that means that the applications are in compliance with the contract. Uh, that means that the architect is doing its job to certify the work as it progresses. That means that the lien releases and the waivers are coming in as appropriate. Uh, liens are the greatest thing that are, that are really going to affect a owner's payment process because construction loan documents require uh, the project to be free and clear from all encumbrances uh, and liens really put a project, um, it, it puts it off kilter um, such that a lot of prime contracts between owners and the general contractor will require uh, payment bonds in place, performance bonds, things like that. Um, which enable the project, the property itself, to stay free and clear from lien encumbrances and gives the lien ors an opportunity to seek redress through the bonding process itself. Um, I think another uh, issue that affects owners and it really becomes a risk uh, well, you don't want to, as an owner, you don't want to get out in front of your contractors. Uh, you you really want to keep your your the project smoothly administered by paying. Paying is 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 the the real critical component because uh, you've got to uh, ensure that the uh, the contractor is not carrying too much cost and that the subs cash flows not so strapped that it's affecting the quality of performance. So you've got to pay and pay timely. But uh, there's also a risk there that an overpayment. Uh, you only want to pay for work that's performed, work that's been certified uh, pursuant to the uh, terms of your contract. Uh, so overpayment, I can see that being uh, an issue. You also want to be sure that uh, um, a, a risk in the payment process is that you're not certifying uh, defective work that you're not certifying work that doesn't meet quality and workmanship standards uh, and that the work that you are certifying and that you're paying for is actually completed work in accordance with the level at which it's been certified. Uh, you want to ensure that if there has been some issues uh, with um, payment or quality of workmanship um, that some retainage uh, that the contractor has uh, and that the owner's uh, been able to uh, store away, uh, you want to ensure that that covers defects. Um, from the contractor's side, payments 
payments, the name of the game for the contractor is payments, making sure that the money is flowing, making sure that they're not carrying costs for too long, making sure that uh, um, you're managing the float there. Uh, and in the payment process for subs or for general contractors, you also are managing the, the, the you have all the contract administration uh, issues to be concerned about that you might have uh, just from an owner's perspective. Are you fulfilling all the terms of the contract and administering it? Uh, the added burden from a general contractor's perspective is uh, ensuring their subs are performing. So you're certifying in your payment applications with the uh, owner uh, that the work has been performed. It's been performed in accordance with standards. Uh, it's been performed to the respective percentages or dollar amounts that you've certified it as. And that's going to be your sworn statement. That's what's going to bind you both for lien purposes and likely for contract purposes. So uh, managing your project is absolutely a, a strong consideration and a huge risk if you're not the type of hands-on general contractor that is able to near perfectly certify performance on a, a project. And then addressing risks from the sub standpoint, I think that we've gone into that a, a good amount, but uh, cash flow. It's all about cash flow for the subs. They're the ones who are floating the job in the largest degree because they're the first to do work, last to get paid. Um, I think that a really underrated <coughs> risk for a subcontractor <coughs> excuse me, is the contractual liabilities that they're taking on. Uh, the subs are the folks that have the least amount of bargaining power, uh, yet the terms are getting crammed down their throats. Uh, from the, the contractors and they're taking on a lot of the performance risk. Um, they're getting things like contingent payment clauses put in there. They're getting uh, additional insured requirements by everybody all the way up the stream uh, put into their subcontracts. They're getting um, um, you know, no, no damages for delay type of things which are affecting uh, perhaps their, uh, their ability to move and go on to other, contra or other projects. So uh, I th uh, the biggest ri risks for the subs are contractual liability and cash flow. But great, great question, and uh, I think that based on the breadth of the answer, you can see that there's risks for all parties involved in the payment uh, on a construction project and the administration of a construction project. So uh, I'll move on to our next question here. Um, what happens if items are left out of the application for payment? Um, well, that's <laughs> a lot of the answers to these type of questions. Uh, it depends on the contract, uh, which is such a lawyerly answer. But if you're a, a contractor there out there or you're, you're a non-lawyer you can actually take some comfort in that uh, answer and from a general proposition in the sense that it w if it depends on the contract that means you have the ability to affect the terms and to affect your outcome and to control your own destiny so uh, the more that you negotiate the better you negotiate and the quality of your advocacy on the front end will really determine on uh, you know, what your liabilities are on the back end. So w addressing the particular question, what happens if items are lay lay left out of the pay application, I think that there's a high degree of likelihood that a waiver scenario has been set up. Uh, think about what you're doing from a contractor's standpoint in a pay application you're certifying the progress of the project. You're certifying leaners have been paid. You're certifying certain amounts are due. Uh, and if you're doing that, you're doing it as your sworn statement. There is a responsibility on your part <clears throat> to do your diligence, to make your certifications accuracy. And as you can imagine, you're inducing reliance on the other party's part. The architect's going to make its decision on uh, approving the pay application based on your certifications. 
the owner and the lender, or the owner's going to pay and the lender's going to fund based on the contractor certification. So when you're inducing reliance, as pay applications reasonably do, and if that reliance is detrimental, I think that you've set up a lot of good waiver defenses if you've improperly uh, left out items of your pay application and you seek to remedy them in the future. Now, when I say it depends on the contract, you can build in uh, mechanisms in the contract which address the uh, the failure to, to the, the remedy component. Uh, for instance, uh, all uh, any items, any corrections made for uh, items uh, not included, uh, but withheld in good faith or uh, negligently, um, might be addressed as a as a codicil type of provision in a contract. So um, the, the other, oh, the only other thing I have to add to that is I think that there's a good example, or there's a good um, basis to to say that that you've waived the lien rights if you've certified uh, payments that are inaccurate, um, and I think that uh, if you've done it uh, willfully, you've really as a contractor, open yourself up to a whole other host of claims and issues, uh, which is a good segue into our next question that was submitted, um, and that's what if fraud is committed in the application for payment? And that's um, that's a that's a, a good. Qu I was looking at these questions just now; they're all great questions. Uh, this that's a good question. If fraud is committed. Of course, you're going to have all of the other remedies that you have uh, for fraud that's available at common law. Uh, you're going to have um, certainly a breach of contract uh, because a material misrepresentation uh, and a material breach has been made, um, in which you're going to go through the breach of contract analysis, is incorporating what damages are there. Uh, you might be able to um, rescind the contract if the, the fraud is to the spirit of the, uh, the bargain between the parties. Um, if fraud has been committed in the pay application and it was ultimately not paid and that was reduced to a lien, then you're going to have some remedies for a fraudulent lien if the fraudulent lien was tantamount to a willful exaggeration of the amounts due and owing, if it was a, uh, if the lien or was grossly negligent in compilation of the lien, uh, such that it it uh, is tantamount to a, a a fraudulent lien, or a misrepresentation as to work not performed or uh, money's not due and owing, uh, then you've got a fraudulent lien. In fraud, depending on your jurisdiction, you may have a statutory cause of action for fraudulent lien. Fraudulent liens, by nature, uh, in, in they're pretty draconian punishments in the sense that they're a private cause of action. There's normally uh, interest that's associated with the fraudulent lien claims. There's attorney's fees provisions that are, are included in a fraudulent lien claim. And there's even a punitive component that you can uh, uh, tap into in the event that the lien... Um, there's damages that were resulted uh, from the lien being fraudulently placed upon and clouding the title of the property. Uh, one thing that's also important to be considered of in the pay application, if it's fraudulent, you know, it's not, we're, we're talking about the question was fraudulent, so that's a real delineating factor versus just a negligent, oops, I goofed on the numbers type of scenario. If it's fraudulent, you may have criminal implications here. There are criminal statutes for uh, willfully signing uh, construction documents uh, which overstate uh, uh, the value of, of work or services or goods per, uh, service performed or goods provided. Um, there are also licensure implications. And uh, if you're aggrieved in that as an owner and you have a, a contractor that is willy-nilly misstating payment applications, um, it's well within your rights to go after their licensure. Uh, so it's a good question, and it, in, in the event that fraud is, is proven, you've got a lot of options there. 
Uh, let's see, I've got some other questions here. Um, this question is, what would cause a release of liability provision to be considered vague and ambiguous? Well, I think that largely depends on the who, what, when, where, how of the release of liability provision. So uh, you've got to take it, the contract on its terms, on its face, um, employing traditional contract construal notions at common law, meaning um, it's going to be construed against the drafter. You want clear and unambiguous terms, uh, but you want to see who the release, who who's being released, who's being who's doing the releasing, uh, what extent of liability is being released, um, you know, when is the release triggered, uh, and how is the release of liability effectuated. I think you've got to touch on those terms at least give some type of guidance and construal uh, of the contract term if you're in order to have a pretty valid release of liability uh, provision um, or release of liability uh, if you're talking about an independent release. You can make arguments that anything not addressing those material terms are vague and unambiguous uh, such that the release would be subject to uh, perhaps being unenforceable. Um, next question here. Okay. Um, oftentimes a general contractor does not become entitled to payment until the architect provides his certification for payment. A, what would prevent an architect from providing certification for payment? B, how would the contractor show bad faith, fraud, or deceit on the part of the architect? So that, that's a good question. So I'm, let, me, let me attack the first part, uh, and then we'll move on to the second. So what would prevent an architect from providing certification? Um, well, in sum, work not completed in accordance with the terms of the co uh, contract. Uh, and that might be perhaps flaws in certification. Perhaps it wasn't, per, maybe the, the pay app uh, has 50% of the project signed off as completed when in reality only 30% are completed in accordance with the uh, design specs. Uh, or maybe there's some workmanship issues. Uh, or maybe there's some unpaid lien ors out there and uh, the architect's aware of it. Uh, at any rate, uh, it, if there's uh, uh, the contract's not complied with, it's incumbent upon the architect to kick it back to the contractor and work those type of issues out. Uh, when, you, when the certification occurs, that's the architecture's, that triggers the architecture's liability under its, architect's liability under its contract, and they're going to want to ensure that, that what they're certifying has in fact been accomplished in accordance with the terms of the contract. So the second question was, how could the contractor show bad faith uh, on the part of the architect? And I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, it's going to be a fact-intensive uh, inquiry. Uh, you're going to have to show that uh, performance occurred and that the architect perhaps through some improper influence or personal motives or whatever, has failed to certify uh, in good faith, uh, you're going to have to show some, some type of fraud or deceit, and, and you're going to have to likely support it with an independent third-party evaluation of that. Um, sometimes that's going to be uh, addressed in the contract. Not likely, because in most of the contracts, the architect is the independent decision-maker, it's their authority to certify, and if they haven't certified in, in good faith, then now you're in a breach situation where you've got breach of the contract on the owner's part because the architect's acting as its agent, and then perhaps an independent cause of action against the um, architect. Um, in that situation, I presume that I would I would try to have another architect come in, review the situation, analyze it perhaps even another performance expert, uh, another contractor, or some type of expert uh, 
come in and evaluate the application and the uh, project progress and provide a supplemental to the opinion to the architect, which perhaps may change their mind in certification or at a minimum, uh, or, or if it's fraudulent, uh, outline exactly how they feel that uh, the uh, non-approval was uh, deceitful. And I think you've set yourself well, up well as a contract in that situation for uh, not performing uh, going forward based on an owner or architect breach. Um, the course code is 473. The course code is 473. Uh, I think that probably, I, we've got a couple of, of additional questions, but I think that, that uh, we're time restricted. So um, if you have any further questions, you can email me. My email address is cjimerson at jimersoncobb.com. Uh, and my telephone number is 904-389-0050. Uh, I'm at the law firm of Jimerson Cobb. You can Google them and go to our website. And uh, we also have some resources available on our website. But uh, feel free to email me direct with your questions. And uh, time permitting, I'll get back to you in response. Thank you for your time and attention. I wish you the best of luck in your practice.